Before I start off this video, just know that I'm going to be doing this for mostly an American perspective for a few reasons. First off, God bless America. Second off, the Russians are a bit stingy with their private spacecraft documents. Anyways, the first rockets were made in ancient China. These were solid-fueled rockets, which worked by burning a solid propellant and ejecting the gas to create thrust. It wasn't until March 16, 1926, when Robert Goddard invented the first liquid-fueled rocket. Liquid-fueled rockets work by explosively combining liquid fuel and an oxidizer to create thrust. Simpler rockets were powered by pressurized tanks that forced the liquid fuel and oxidizer into a combustion chamber. More complex types of liquid-fueled rockets were powered by gas generators, which burned fuel to spin pumps for the main engine. Eventually, the Germans found this technology and thought, hmm, let's put a bomb on it. And so the V-2 missile was born. These missiles were mainly used for war until one day, a V-2 missile traveled past the Harman line and into space. After the war ended, both the Soviets and the Americans recruited these German scientists into their own militaries. One of these scientists was Werner von Braun. Remember him, he's important later. Actually, I'm not sure if he'll even be mentioned again in this video, but he'll definitely be in part two. Anyways, both nations took these scientists and used them to make their own series of ballistic missiles. These missiles were quite limited in range and could only go a few hundred miles. But what if your target was a bit further away? Well, both nations thought of this independently and they each created their own intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Soviets made the R-7, which had four side boosters, each with four main engines and two Vernier engines, which I definitely pronounced right the first time. Werner engines. The main engines were fixed in place, while the Vernier engines would swivel around to help steer the rocket. These boosters would separate in what is known as the Korolev Cross. After a few years of hiding behind their nukes, one of these missiles was used for good. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1 into orbit. This mission shortly followed by the creatively named Sputnik 2. What set Sputnik 2 apart from the rest of the satellites launched up to this point is that it had a dog named Laika on board. A lot of people think that Leica was the first dog in space, but in reality, there are a bunch of suborbital dogs before her. I got a list of all of them, I'll just put it on screen real quick. Honorable mention to Zeke and Chazgon, because they were the first to make it to space and return safely. The same can't be said for the Alberts. You see, a few years before this, the US started strapping monkeys to missiles, and the first one was named Albert. He sadly suffocated, and his rocket didn't even make it to space. America decided to name the next one, Albert II. A few Alberts later, they finally recovered Albert VI alive. But by this point, the Soviets had already launched the Zeke and Jazgan, so yeah. Back to 1957. America saw the Russian success with these orbital tests, and they knew they had to do something before the public started to think that the Russians were more advanced than them. So they put a guidance unit on a modified redstone first stage. Atop this guidance unit was a third stage, which fit into a second stage, which was shrouded under the fourth and final stage, which would carry the payload into low Earth orbit. The payload and housing would actually start spinning prior to launch. The payload in question was Explorer 1, the first American satellite. A few explorers later, America was getting a bit bored of Earth orbit and wanted to get to the moon. So they created the Pioneer Probe, which would be launched atop a Thor Able rocket, which had two liquid-fueled stages to get the craft mostly into orbit. Then, a solid third stage would be used to raise the apogee to where the moon will intersect it. After the probe would detach from the third stage, it would use its own tiny SRBs to slow down and get captured into lunar orbit. Anyways, Pioneer Zero launched on August 17th. Oh shoot, never mind. So they grabbed a probe from the box of spare pioneers and tried again. The next flight started off smoothly, but it veered a bit off course, leading it to not have enough delta V to reach the moon. So they tried again, but the third stage failed to start. America was a bit tired of failed missions at this point and were presumably out of spare pioneers. America decided it would be a better idea to just scrap the lunar orbit idea and just go for a lunar flyby instead. The Soviets have also been trying to get to the moon for some time now with similar amounts of success. This was the Luna probe, but there was one small problem. Their current launch vehicle couldn't even get it to orbit, let alone to a translunar injection. So the Soviets added an upper stage to the R-7. This upper stage was powered by a vacuum-optimized RD-0109, which had an ISP of 323.5 in a vacuum. Speaking of ISP, ISP stands for Specific Impulse, the smart people at NASA use these big words and big equations that are quite hard to understand. 
All you really need to know is that ISP equals the thrust of the rocket over the weight of the fuel used per second. And just know that the higher the ISP, the more efficient the rocket engine is. There are many factors contributing to the ISP of a rocket, but one of the biggest factors is the pressure of the gas exiting the nozzle compared to the ambient pressure. You see, if the gas pressure is similar to the surrounding atmosphere, the plume will go straight, but when the atmosphere thins as we go higher, the nozzle pressure will stay the same and the plume will appear to expand, which would lead to wasted thrust and a lower ISP. One way to fix this would be expanding the nozzle, which would result in a lower exit pressure and a higher ISP in a vacuum. But if you had one of these nozzles at sea level, you would have the opposite problem. I guess it would have been more appropriate to explain this earlier with the Thor Abo rocket. What was I talking about? Oh yeah. The Russians launched their probe and got a lunar flyby, shortly followed by the Americans. The Luna 1 probe was actually supposed to impact the moon, but missed. I mean, whatever beats the Americans. At this point in time, both nations started developing crude spaceflight, but this comes with many challenges, like extreme temperatures, radiation, micrometeorites, and the complete lack of pressure. Russia had successfully launched and recovered some dogs from space, but they haven't even attempted to recover any of the orbital tests so far. A major challenge for crewed spaceflight is re-entry. You see, to stay in orbit, you have to be going quite fast, and if you're going that fast in the atmosphere, all the air would be compressed in front of you, generating a lot of heat. One way to solve this problem is to have an ablative heat shield which would ablate away little pieces of itself and take the heat with it. The first probe to be recovered from orbit was the Discovery 13 probe. It had a parachute, a heat shield, and it was launched atop the aforementioned Thor Abel rocket. This probe was successfully recovered, proving it was possible to recover something from orbit. This information was vital to the construction of the Mercury capsule. This capsule had a drogue chute, main chute, and a landing skirt under the heat shield to soften the blow of impact. This capsule also had different thrusters that would fire unaligned with the center of mass to help control the attitude. These thrusters were powered by a monopropellant, which was hydrogen peroxide. There were separate tanks of helium, which would push the peroxide into a chamber with a catalyst. This catalyst would turn a little bit of peroxide into a lot of gas. Atop this capsule was a launch escape tower. It would pull away the crew to safety in case anything bad happened. They created a new rocket, called the Little Joe rocket. This was meant to test the launch escape tower. For the suborbital flights, the capsule was mounted on a redstone first stage. This configuration of the rocket was nowhere near powerful enough to get to orbit. For future orbital flights, they would have needed a way to slow down and dip into the atmosphere. So they added a retro pack of SRBs to the capsule, which would complete the deorbit burn. Remember now, the Americans weren't the only ones developing crude spaceflight. The Russians had the Vostok spacecraft. It was split into two parts, the return capsule and the service module. They would separate prior to re-entry. Inside the return capsule is where the cosmonaut would sit. After re-entry, the cosmonaut would be ejected out of the capsule. The hatch would open, and the seat would blast out of the capsule before deploying its own parachutes. In previous missions, the ejection seat was swapped out for a capsule for dogs. Vostok 1 launched on April 12, 1961, carrying Yuri Gagarin into orbit. This was closely followed by the U.S. mission, Freedom 7, which carried Alan Shepard into a suborbital trajectory. On this mission, a retro pack was included, even though it would have served no purpose on the suborbital trajectory. Now I can't wait to talk about the hard-to-animate Saturn, Gemini, and Soyuz programs. Oh, look at the time. It's the end of the video. This took way too long to make. Please subscribe and stay tuned for part two.